Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California and we are a teaching institute that focuses on hands-on courses to improve your skills and knowledge in dentistry. And today we're going to talk about the MO only on tooth number 15. In the previous video we blocked out these teeth and you'll see that we've left some block out in the defects that we're going to ultimately cover with an onlay. I suppose you could have done a direct composite here or an amalgam or a ceramic onlay, but this whole series is about gold inlays and onlays. So we're going to show you here how we prepare this tooth from start to finish. One of the things you want to pay attention to is when you block out, don't overfill because you'll get a false idea of how deep you're supposed to be. Remember, you do have an incline of a cusp it's going to go towards the central groove and in that central groove area you want to make sure you're deep enough so I like to use a 330 burr which is about 1.5 is a little longer and make a little slit down the middle of the preparation and once you've made this little slit then you have a reminder of how deep your pulpal wall should be You know, for the most part, we're just going to imagine that the block out is two structure, except when it approaches the DEJ, we're going to want to extend the outline form so that the block out is not allowing undermine enamel to uh, remain. And so this is just a quick procedure uh, where we're going to make sure that we are 1.5 millimeters all the way across the pulpal and even in that distal lingual groove area. Once we have this little slit here, that'll serve as the reminder of where we need to go with our burr. And you can see here with the RGS-1 instrument, I can measure this and verify that I am in fact uh, at least 1.5 millimeters. So the first burr we're going to start with is not a tapered Fisher burr as many people uh, would like to use for an inlay, but we're going to utilize a straight Fisher burr called a 57. And the whole idea here is that you want to create the amount of taper that you need, not necessarily what the burr gives you. And inlays need to have a pretty easy draw. They can't have really tight walls because the castings are really difficult to seat and it's more likely for you to have a wax pattern that's distorted. So we're going to be tipping the burr perpendicular to the wall which we are cutting against. So that means that the burr is going to be leaning bucklingually but also mesial distally where applicable. I'm going to go ahead and speed up, speed up this next section so that we uh, can get through this a little quicker. But we're just utilizing that original pulpal depth cut as our bottom of where the burr will be and uh, we're extending the outline so that we are trying to expose all the enamel and have the enamel supported by dentin and not by blockout material. I suppose you could have the blockout material support the enamel and there have been some studies to show that that actually can work uh, but I'm going to extend the outline form past the block out area so that the block out is just supporting dentin. You can see how the, the draw is quite evident. It, it's sort of the about the amount of draw you might find in a Dixie cup. I'm just showing from a different angle how we are providing the flares for the proximal before we drop the box and this is a a difficult thing to do because you're so tempted to drop the box but I would encourage you to try to complete the outline form on the occlusal before you drop the box and that way you have a guide for where the box will be located and this draws a little too much and, it, and having a little too much is easy you just upright the walls so we're just doing a little bit of uprighting. If you don't taper enough and then you have to taper more, you can end up widening your outline form. But if you're wide to begin with, you can always make it less tapered by uprighting the burr. And here you see it as we're now ready to discuss the exit angles a little bit more. 
Uh, the draw is pretty pretty clear. You can see all the walls. Uh, we're going to need to do some on laying back there on the marginal ridge. But you can see all the walls all the way around. And um, the next thing we're going to want to do is get the exit angles to be 135 degrees. And that would be uh, pretty easy because it's 45 degrees plus 90. Uh, so when you measure this, you can even use the RGS instrument to give you an idea what that's supposed to be. So the 169L can be used to glide past the adjacent tooth contact in an attempt to get this 135 degree exit angle. You can use the tip of the 169L at first and then work your way down to avoid hitting the adjacent tooth. But you are going to be really close to it uh, while you're doing this. You definitely want to have ample clearance with the adjacent tooth because castings require a finishing procedure that, that um, uses discs and those discs have to be able to fit easily into those embrasure areas. So you can see that we've got a pretty good um, exit angle start. And then just use the 169L to drop the box. And you want to keep the box narrow buccolingually at first. And just try to re reach the gingival. And when you're, when you're at this stage, you can now uh, widen it just a little bit more buccolingually. And utilize the draw you've established on the occlusal right here. When you drop your burr into the box, you can then get the right tip of the 169L while you're doing the exit angles. So it's a nice reference. So here we are dropping down and some of our block out comes flying out of there. That's always great when that happens. And uh, we're working our way along the facial flare. And now we're showing you the lingual flare, how we're gonna move the burr over to match that initial line that we drew, that exit angle we drew with the burr on the occlusal. And uh, it's kind of neat because you have this uh, reference point to, that you're shooting for. So at this point, uh, the prep is looking pretty good. It's, it's kind of roughed out uh, with the exit angles. Uh, and that will never show on the facial. That'll be hidden behind the height of contour of the first molar. And you want to try to get the floor flat and you want to tip the axial wall towards the center of the tooth and lean it and then we also want to make sure all the walls can be seen at the same time when you're looking from the occlusal. That lingual area is going to be taken care of with a feature called a bale, B-A-L-E, and that'll be performed uh, shortly. But remember, we have all these defects on the occlusal, this wear, and that's why we're opting for an onlay. We could have filled these areas with gold foil. Uh, we could have uh, basically ignored them, but we thought we'd show an onlay today. 7404 is a, an incredible burr. It's 1.4 millimeters at its widest area, not at the tip and not at the uh, shank, but at the, in the, kind of in the middle. And you can use this to start reducing this C-plane. This is the non-functional cusp reduction. And follow the morphology of the tooth. Uh, don't flatten things. You want to kind of follow the morphology. It just creates a more natural looking onlay when you're finished and it actually makes it look more aesthetic. It blends into the normal uh, morphology, the anatomy of the teeth when you view this from the facial. And then we're going to use this for the functional cusp reduction. This would be the A-plane and the the widest part is 1.4 so you can go all the way down to the widest area and then you have a really good idea of how deep you are so it's a fantastic uh, way to make sure that you're reducing enough because after all you're not able to check occlusal clearance with a rubber dam in place and we'll just go ahead and like we did on the facial of course the facial we reduce a little bit less because that's an aesthetic area and it's not under a lot of load compared to lingual so we're going to reduce more on the lingual side than we do on the facial typically, just for preservation of aesthetics. And then um, we'll just follow that across the distal lingual as well. And then here would be the B plane, the middle plane, and we need to reduce that 1.5 as well. And we're doing that here. And back here on the distal lingual. Because the burr is football shaped, it, it does allow you to create this hollow grind effect uh, and you can get 
some really nice features like this little bale uh, that give you plenty of bulk. You don't need to put a box there on the lingual. You can use this, this bird for that purpose. And right here you can see that instead of placing a shoulder, as we've been taught by Schillingberg and others, we can utilize uh, more of a hollow groin effect that was uh, introduced to me by Dr. Richard V. Tucker uh, probably about 25 years ago. And now we have some cleanup to do in the box, and this is where you want to get out your hand instruments. We also have to put a finishing bevel, and we're also going to add a really cool retentive feature called a slot on the distal coming up shortly. So let's stay with this. I think it's a good idea to uh, find some really nice carbon steel instruments, a 43S off angle chisel on the left, and this is a 233 Tucker instrument on the right. And these instruments are indispensable, particularly if they're carbon steel, for refining your box. We're going to start with the off angle chisel, and we're just going to chop down the lingual proximal wall and then the facial proximal wall really focusing on the line angle on the internal, not so much on the wall. We've got that pretty smooth with the burr ourselves. And then uh, just go across that internal line angle between the axial and the gingival. And then we'll turn it like this so that we can now run the instrument down the axial wall to remove that little groove that we might have placed in there when we were working on the proximal. So you really have to plane all three walls. I think it'd be good to show this from another angle. So let's turn the type on this way and then look at it from the facial view and see that the blade of the instrument is right up against the wall with the cutting edge exposed. You can see the cutting edge while you're using it. We just turn the instrument around and it lines up really nicely with that exit angle that we've created in the previous steps. You can use it also to remove any roughness on the pulpal wall and even refine some of the line angles up there too if you like. You can also use the 42S off angle chisel. So now let's uh, place the gingival bevel and we're going to start in the middle and rotate the uh, 233 Tucker gingival margin trimmer towards the lingual. We'll turn the instrument around and then we're going to engage the instrument right in the middle and then push it over towards the facial side. It's kind of a rotating type plowing maneuver, not so much of a scraping maneuver. I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Warren K. Johnson, who uh, really taught me everything I know about using hand instruments. And here we have the H248S, which is a really nice carbide that has a little end on it that is 60 degrees, which matches the 233 Tucker gingival margin trimmer beautifully. So when you encounter some really hard enamel, like in this particular case, and you can't get it to machine very well with the hand instrument, you can do this with this burr, just using the edge of that uh, burr between the straight side and the tip. There's a little angle and you'll be able to create a really nice 60 degree bevel that will line up with the bevel that you attempted with the 233. And then it's always nice to kind of go back over the bevel just a little bit with the hand instruments. Hand instruments are the best to use to make a really straight, really refined uh, margin and wall. Now I'm ready to uh, place the finishing bevel on the facial and there are many ways to do this. Sometimes you can even just use a disc like a little cuddle disc just to take off the sharp edge. Uh, other times you uh, would just use a 7404 like this just to create a very small little finishing bevel. And sometimes you'll want to make the finishing bevel a little bit heavier than this because you have uh, some really weak tooth structure. And you see how I'm just kind of going over that marginal ridge. In this particular case, because we placed a third molar in the Taipanon, uh, I, um, I'm not uh, going to drop a really heavy bale back there or a hollow grind or a bevel because uh, we'd run into the contact area. But here I can kind of leave it up a little higher. And notice that we're doing with the 7404s, 
we're just painting on the finish line. We want the finish line to be as smooth as possible and you can see this from the facial. The reduction makes the tooth look like you hardly even reduced it. And then when you look from the side you can see some defects. Uh, and it's always a good idea to view your preparations from the outside in and make those corrections. This is the slot and the reason we're doing this is we just don't have a lot of retention form and resistance form is good actually but the retention form is a little compromised so we'll make a little slit across this back area here right about where the DEJ would be located and then we'll follow that up with a slot with a 169L carbide. And I'd like to get this slot about 1.5 to 2 millimeters deep so that it has a it's pretty robust and it really hangs on quite well and instead of dropping a box this is kind of a neat alternative could we have dropped a box on the distal definitely uh, but there were no carries there and we thought that we could uh, perhaps preserve that part of the tooth so it's a little shallow so we go a little deeper and remember when you when you're making this slot you're essentially making an inlay within an inlay and you need to pay attention to draw right now the depth is great but the slot does not have adequate draw with the mesial box. You can see there's an undercut and you can't resolve that unless you tip that wall on the mesial of the slot a little bit more mesially. And one way to do that is a 169L. The other way is you could use um, this 7901 carbide to just go around the circumference of the slot, perhaps putting a little bit more pressure on the mesial so you can get a better draw. I think that's uh, an easy way to deal with that situation. So try to have everything nice and smooth and continuous. Uh, you have plenty of reduction for the, uh, the onlay at this point and everything looks reasonably smooth. It's never smooth enough in my opinion. I think there's always things you can do to make it a little bit better but I think that this one will turn out okay and I think the casting uh, should fit well if we do everything right. You know we have a, a course for castings coming up this year. We, we run it every year in December and 2019 the course is uh, December 13th through 15th and would love to see you there. It will completely sell out that's for sure they always do and uh, I just want you to know that this course is available and you have um, the final result here there's still some debris in the prep and we need to kind of clean that out before we're ready to take the impression but we have several more preparations uh, to do in this quadrant before we're worried about taking the impression. Nice little slot there and uh, you can see the bevel on the bottom of the box and then of course the finishing bevel out here on the facial. So uh, it's been fun doing this. Talk to you later.